Hey guys, welcome to the Quick Talk Podcast, the only show handcrafted for small business entrepreneurs looking to explode their business. It's time to get your mind right so you can get your grind right. Are you ready? If you can take a vacation or your busy season and not worry about checking in on your office and everything like that, then you've built a business. You've built something that's that's viable. Hello. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Once again, my name is Josh Latimer, and my mission, as you know, is to deliver you, the listener, power-packed, no-fluff business insights by some of the small business success stories from all over the world. And today, I am joined by Michael Geller and... Matt Adwell, our first double interview. I'm so excited. They're co-founders of Tweak Consulting and they each run a respective cleaning business in the state of Maryland. Now, Mike is a copywriting and marketing guru. In fact, his cleaning business got 86 estimate requests in one day. (laughs) That does not happen by accident, folks. And Matt Adwell has been called a master problem solver. He's been actually in the cleaning business, the window cleaning business for 23 plus years. And together they make up Tweak Consulting, which helps small business owners make the adjustments they need inside their companies to be more profitable, have turnkey freedom and better scalability. Guys, welcome to the show. How are you? Doing well, Josh. Thanks for having us. I'm excited here. It's a beautiful day in Costa Rica. Uh, my kids are playing. There's fruit trees all over the place. There's monkeys and iguanas running around. And we're going to talk about business. What can be better than that? I haven't done a double interview before, but maybe we'll start with you, Mike. Uh, if you could give us a little bit of background about where you kind of started in the business world and being an entrepreneur and kind of what brought you to Tweak Consulting. Uh, if you want to start way back when, uh, I started by selling snow shoveling at about 10 years old with uh, four other guys doing the work. Uh, We did a $2,000 day way back when. And then through the years, uh, I I was working to become a full-time magician. I did become a full-time magician and did very well with it. Uh, But because of that, and that was my focus, I've had 43 different jobs in my life. Wow. Which is, uh, I used to look at it as a detriment, but it really has been a benefit. Yeah, that's really interesting. So being a magician, do you just basically trick people out of their money or do you actually provide value to them? (laughs) houses magically clean themselves yeah yeah no i'm just kidding so 43 different jobs that's that is an excessive number but that would give you a diverse variety of life experiences and perspectives absolutely um and and then on top of that running your own thing uh, early on as a as a magician uh there's no show without business and uh it, it forced me to learn the business side of things. That's actually a very important point because any business is really, there's an element of putting on a show for your customers. Sometimes really small companies don't take that serious enough. They don't understand that it's almost a performance. In, in our business, we called it the customer life cycle, but there's all these different opportunities to engage and impress and, and blow the minds of your customers. But if you don't pre-plan that process or that cycle, then you can really miss the boat. Absolutely. One of the things that was taught to me by uh, one of my mentors, uh, Denny Haney, who happened to also uh, help mentor David Copperfield and a bunch of other pro guys, which was cool that I was able to study under him. He, he brought out the point that if it doesn't add, it detracts. Uh, and that's a really good rule uh, when it comes to copywriting, when it comes to marketing, but also uh, in customer interactions and things. You want to make sure that, that you're adding value constantly to the interaction uh, and not just wasting the person's time. So you always want to to, to, to look at things and go, well, does this add value or is this a detractor by being neutral or, or negative? Absolutely. You don't just do things to do them. There has to be a predetermined, specific, valuable, power-packed reason why you're doing them. And that's really what systemizing your business is all about. It's about identifying all those touch points and then building out ahead of time a logical, intelligent methodology to help grow and scale your business. Is that kind of what you mean? Absolutely. And as a magician, one of the things uh, to when I was performing full time and all that, you're thinking ahead, seven, eight steps ahead of the person who's watching. Uh, And it's the same way with the customer, same way in business. You need to be thinking ahead and you need to be looking at how how does this appear to to them? How does this come off to them? Uh, So it really helps when you're when you're marketing to kind of think and have that background uh, of a magician a little bit to to realize how how it's all a show. And it, it, it you know, not to say that we don't give genuine value, but there is a certain amount of uh, perceived 
value that is just that. It's perceived value. There is no maybe not genuine value behind it, but the customer perceives it and, and appreciates it uh, and things like that. So there is a little bit of that uh, that goes into it. Yeah, well, perception is reality in life and in business for sure. And in your job as a CEO of your company, and yes, you are a CEO, even if you're the only employee, you should have a CEO's mentality. Your job is to create that perception. I, I want to ask you, Matt, a little bit about your back, background sure. and how did you meet Mike and you know, how did you end up with this tweet consulting thing and coming out of the cleaning business? So my background, I ended up, I started as a window cleaner back in 1992 and picked it up kind of to support myself doing some volunteer work. And I worked for a company for about 18 years and everything from being a technician to running the residential and project side of the business and heading up the training elements as well. So I kind of walked away with that with a good feel for what people wanted as far as clients, which to me is very important because if you can figure out what people want, then you can figure out how to give it to them. I also, uh, I guess, coming from that as well, I saw things within the company that I liked and wanted to imitate, but I also saw things that I would do differently. And so I kind of took that experience and in, I guess, January 2011 is when we really went full force and started Adwell services and so far so good. We're running you know three crews now and it's going pretty well. It looks like these good things on the horizon there. As far as meeting Mike, it's kind of funny. We live 45 minutes apart. In fact, he had stayed with my brother <laughs> on one occasion and we'd never met. We went all the way to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to uh, end up meeting at a convention, finding out that we knew, actually should have already known each other years before. Well, that's really interesting. And it is a small world with that. It's really nice to be able to meet like-minded people and, and have other, you know, business influences in your life to help push you along. And it's really cool that you guys ended up forming, forming a partnership. I want to, I want to circle back. Something you said in the first part of your response was that you're good at ident identifying customer needs and what customers want. And this is an often overlooked thing, in my opinion, because in software, I have a software company. What we call it in the software business is a product market fit. You know, what itch are you scratching, so to speak? And in the cleaning business, the lawn care business, the, it doesn't really matter what type of service business it is. It's critical that you understand exactly what itch to scratch, what people want, rather than what you think they want, right? And isn't there a difference between, you know, we think people want this, but maybe they really want something else? Oh, there's a huge difference. I, I guess for years I actually did like storefront route type window cleaning. And you, in doing that, you learn to figure out what each manager was looking for, what things really mattered to them, whether they cared about quality, whether they cared that you just didn't mess their stuff up. Same kind of happened with uh, in homeowners and figuring out what they really cared about. You listen to them, they tell you what they like and they don't like because they they uh, have had experiences in the past that they relate to you. So all of those things kind of, if you pay attention and you know what you're looking for, people are very clear with what they want. And a lot of times we have our notions about what we think they should want, but those things don't fit. And if we can really listen to people, that gives us a huge advantage. Well, you just hit the nail on the head. Keyword here, listen. We have to open our ears up, right? God gave us one mouth and two ears. I don't know how many times my grandma and my mom would beat that into my head when I was like eight years old. And, uh, but it's, it's actually really true. We need to listen to our customers and understand you know, where we need to be scratching, right? Because if you're an itch scratcher, which is really what all businesses are, um, people people will continuously come back for more, right? But if you're scratching something that doesn't itch, um, there's not going to be an easy way to, to scale a business around that. Mike, let me ask you a couple questions here. You are a voracious reader. <laughs> and uh, I just know from being in some of the circles that you're in that you read so many books that it's just, it's just unbelievable. So what, what's the best book that you've read in the last year? Uh, in the last year, I would have to say uh, Profit First from Mike Michalowicz. Uh, that book it should be right up there with E-Myth and, and uh, uh, Duct Tape Marketing and a lot of these other great books. Uh, that, that book is just such practical advice for, for running a business. It's kind of the idea of, okay, accounting, general practices, general accounting practices are sales minus expenses equal profit. Well, 
if you're like most people, expenses keep coming. If you if you let it, uh, you can always find something to spend money on in your business. Uh, new equipment, uh, this broke, that broke, and before you know it, the profit that should be there for the owner uh, isn't there, and the owner finds himself working like a dog and needing more sales just to cover payroll if you're not careful. Uh, the profit first mentality is this, that sales minus profit equals expenses. That sounds kind of strange, but the, 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 the factor of it is that you end up taking out your profit percentage first. What's left then is what you have to run your business on. And if you can't run your business on that, because the other percentages are the correct percentages for you that you find and you, what you, you do, then you have a problem. Then you've, you've got to tighten the belt on your business and run your business correctly. And it's just a, just changing that one mentality, that one, one thought really is uh, groundbreaking. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really interesting. It's very similar. It reminds me of Robert Kiyosaki's concept of pay yourself first. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Matt, what about you? Are you a big reader? What's the best book you've read in the last year? Um, I, no, I am a big reader. I read a lot of fiction over the years. I've read hundreds of books, but uh, I'm not a huge business book reader, uh, but I read the ones that Mike tells me I should read. <laughs> so <laughs> the best book for me in the last year has been The Pumpkin Plan, also by Mike Malkowitz. And that book to me was revolutionary for figuring out exactly what niche your company should be in and making sure that it's focused exactly uh, as it should be to be able to be profitable. Yeah, I think sometimes small business guys think that to make more money, they need to offer more stuff mm. rather than actually drilling down and, and focusing even more on something super specific. Yeah, and and for me, as we're kind of scaling our business now, it was it spoke to me a lot because I'm in the process of training employees, building systems into the company, building trucks, buying equipment, and so if I don't have to buy tons and tons and tons of equipment and train tons and tons and tons of things and buy all types of different chemicals and have all – the simpler my business runs, the easier it is to scale, the easier it is to train, the easier it is to build out. So it was brilliance from where I sat. Are you looking for a simple way to get more sales, more referrals, and strengthen your customer loyalty? Look no further than SendJim.com. It was handcrafted for you as a powerful tool that will automate your follow-ups after the sale. Imagine being able to stay in contact with your customers all year long by pushing a single button on your smartphone. This is a space age warp speed technology and it will eliminate the chaos inside your business caused by trying to properly follow up with all of your leads and customers. Sign up for a free trial with no credit card required at sendgym.com right now. What are you waiting for? When you're a little bit anemic in the sales department, when you're young, when you're trying to get it going, fire up the engine, I think a panic, a slow underlying panic can set in where you say, oh my God, I need more money. We need more sales. I, I need to also do this service. I need to be lawn care. I need to do carpet cleaning. And, and you think that going horizontal is the answer, you know, offering, being everything to everybody, right? Out of desperation. But really it's more about and I, I'll let you run with this, Mike, a little bit because this is your sweet spot. It's more about crafting a really unique, specific value proposition for a specific person with a specific need, right? Absolutely. And it's difficult to do when you're starting off because you need to make money. You need to survive. And you have a captive customer. You've done a good job for them, let's say, for example, cleaning windows. Uh, and then they, you know, you go, oh, I need the gutters. Okay, I want to do the gutters too. Well, that's not too bad because I have the ladders already and I can do the gutters. Oh, while I'm up there, I noticed that uh, this brick is loose. I, I could go get some mortar and fix that for you. Sure. And, and before you know it, you get away from doing one thing well. And Matt can speak to this. Matt was uh, helped co-found uh, Accelerate, um, and, and, and they, they, they've run some classes on that, on how to make your business more efficient and window cleaning. Uh, and, and it was, you know, I've heard Matt and I had these conversations for hours on end. And, and even with that, Accelerate, I still learn new thoughts and new ideas from it, just in the ways of thinking about your business in terms of efficiencies that, you know, if you're saving 15 seconds here, 15 seconds here, over and over throughout a day, and you're able to get more work done and make more money versus if you're so diversified, you just can't, can't run at that level. Plus it becomes like, I, I see it, see it with a lot of guys who do uh, decks and things like that. 
decks are very knowledge based. You 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 just can't send an amateur to 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 go and strip and uh, and and prep a deck properly. You know, and, and it's the guys get into that, and it's like they can't find anybody who can do it because it's so knowledge based. That's fine if you want to be a solo uh, solo yeah. entrepreneur and and run it yourself. But if you're uh, if you're trying to scale, that that might be a little complicated to do. Not to say that can't be done, and there's systems that can be built to do that. But a lot of times, it's just choosing the correct things to do, knowing where you're trying to go with your business, uh, and then choosing the correct things to get into, knowing those end goals. Yeah, sometimes less is more, and and having a really simple business model is not bad. It doesn't mean that you're you're not smart because you're not overwhelmed by the complexity of your business. No, in fact, some of the biggest franchises, some of the biggest, most popular um, businesses in the country have super simple business models. Like look at Curves, for example, right? This franchise just blew up all over the place a few years back. And all it is is a circuit, like a circle of exercise equipment targeted at, you know, women, middle-aged women that maybe don't feel great about themselves. And they, they sell, you know, spots on that equipment to those people over and over and over and over again all over the country, right? They're a perfect example. They, they looked at it and they went, Where, where's the problem? Where's the hole in the market? And most gyms were... You know, you had meatheads in the gym working out and things like that, and got you know, uh, cat calling women and things like that, and they felt insecure about their bodies and insecure about going into a gym to work out. And now here it is. This is a woman's gym. It's it's we're gonna we're gonna work together to help you. And it's it's a that was a great idea and a great example of pumpkin planting. Instead of trying to be the gym for everybody, they said we're not the gym for everybody. We we're gonna cycle down into to just a specific. Uh, niche that that is powerful and i hope that people are getting this because if you're feeling stressed out out there you're listening to this show and you're saying man i need more sales i gotta grow this company i I want it now i'm i'm impatient i need to grow don't go horizontal don't widen the base of the stuff that you do drill down into the niche listen to your customers find the most itchiest thing you can scratch that's a new phrase (laughs) and and get it done like niche down because a parallel example for the curve things would be a guy who started a gym and he didn't have enough customers. So he said, you know, I'm going to add a women's section over here for like grandmas. And then I'm going to have like a, a mom's area here. And then I'm going to have the meathead section over here. And I'm going to have a flyer go out to my town that talks about all of these things. And, and it would really resonate with no one, right? Because he's trying to be everything to everybody. Example of that just from my magic days was, uh, I, my first business card, it said, uh, Kids' birthday parties and uh, and corporate events. Um, a mentor pointed out those cards are worthless. You might as well throw them in the trash. And I said, "What do you mean?" He <laughs> said, "He says if somebody wants to hire you for a kids' party and they see you do corporate events, they go, oh, he's too expensive. If someone wants to hire you for a corporate event and they see you do kids' parties, they go, oh, I'm not hiring him. He does kids' parties. He's not that good. Uh, so you've just literally isolated yourself out of both markets. And we often do that with our marketing." and with our our jobs and the way we choose to to approach business. I feel like for me, in the young days of my company, I had a lot of fear. I was freaked out. You know, I had left a job at J.P. Morgan Chase as a banker to start a winder cleaning business, which, you know, my own mom wouldn't talk to me for a week because she thought that was the dumbest thing on earth that I could have done. Um, How do people overcome fear? How do we use it to our advantage? What's some insight you guys can can point to in regards to fear in the minds of business owners? Well, I think for me, I I actually use fear. Fear, it it depends on where the fear is. If the fear is in front of you, it sits there like a wall and it keeps you from having the impetus to be able to do the things that you really should do. But if the fear is behind you, it's positioned completely differently. And I'll, I'll use my business as an example. I kind of just decided to quit my job and start my own business, a little like you, Josh. And I have a family, and we had a house, and I had to make it happen. And I had the opportunity to do some subcontract work. And I looked at it, and I realized I didn't want to do that because I would have just limped on that. And so the fear of knowing that I had to make it happen is what drove me. And it kind of reminds me, like, if you see a movie, and you see the guy, he's running across the rooftop, and, you know, the other guy's chasing him. He gets to the edge and he jumps to the next roof and it's this incredible thing and he's completely driven by fear because let's face it, he never would have jumped to that roof otherwise. That fear drove him to be able to have the ability to do something he wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. That is a really, really cool way to to answer that question, Matt. Um, 
I think fear doesn't always have to be a negative, right? I mean, that's kind of the point of what you're saying is that it can it can push you or it can stop you, right? Be a fire. It can drive us. Absolutely, because I always say that I do my best work with a knot in my stomach, and that's true. If I, if anybody listens to Entrepreneur on Fire, it's a really cool podcast. He says, you know, the magic happens outside of your comfort zone, and that's one hundred percent true. If if you don't have any kind of trepidation or anxiety or any kind of nervousness about a project you're working on, I can pretty much guarantee you're not doing anything that significant. What about quotes? Um, we're big on quotes. I like quotes. What's your guys' favorite quote, Mike? It was from uh, Paul Zane uh, Pilsner. Pilsner, he's an economist, and he said, uh, prosperity belongs to those who learn new things the fastest. Yes, being able to adapt, being a jet ski rather than a, a freighter, right? Being able to turn and move and be agile. Absolutely. And so I look at my life and I, I, I'm like, you, you know, what skill sets do I have? The one thing, if I could say one skill set I have more over any other skill set is that I can learn things quickly. I've learned how to learn. Uh, repetition, different means, hands-on, reading, watching, you know, to learn how to learn. If you can learn that skill to be able to teach yourself anything from a book or from a mentor or whatever, uh, to me, that that's probably the most powerful thing you can learn. And so that, that quote resonates very strongly uh, with me. Oh, good one. I like that a lot. Matt, what do you, what do you think? Uh, I guess I would pick... I think it's Henry Bergson was the one who said, think like a man of action and act like a man of thought. And for me, that kind of resonates in that you you pretty much don't have to, you don't want to be a person that's impetuous. Uh, but you also cannot sit there and overanalyze things and never have action. So if you can find the balance between those two things, and be able to have an active thought process and yet be measured enough to be able to act in a reasonable manner and in a prudent way. Absolutely. I mean, you want to have a good work balance between absolute ruthless execution and getting stuff done at a high level and balance that against making sure you're getting the correct stuff done at a high level, right? Exactly. That might be a favorite quote of his. That is not his favorite quote. Uh, if, if you're going to know Matt at all, you're going to know that one of his quotes is going <laughs> to probably had nothing to do with business. Yeah, mo- well, most of my co- quotes come from Fletch or, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or uh, possibly Tommy Boy, you know. I'm a huge Tommy <laughs> Boy fan. It's possible. Huge. I have a plethora of quotes if you really want to know. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little bit about Tweet Consulting, okay? I want to talk about the importance of automation. My passion at this stage in the game is helping people understand that they should want to build the kind of business that they they could sell someday. Doesn't mean they have to sell. People panic when I say that. I don't want to sell it. I'm not trying to do that. I just want this or whatever. But but if your business is set up, right, and it's structured and optimized the right way in, in such a way that you could sell it, In all cases, that's a better scenario, right, than just being a solopreneur, as you called it, or being self-employed. Because if you own a little system that produces income and it doesn't require your your dedication to it every minute, isn't that just such a better situation to be in? And and more than that, how does Tweet Consulting help people accomplish that? Absolutely, Josh. I would agree with you uh, completely that that's, that's the goal. Even if you want to be a solo entrepreneur, you want to create freedoms within your business. Well, I think here's the thing. <clears throat> As business owners, we all know kind of what we need to do. We know that systems are important. Uh, we know kind of where we maybe want to go with a business. Maybe we, we want to have some employees. Well, that's fantastic. You know, we'd like to get out of the field and just run the business from the office. Well, that's fantastic as well. But we have no clue how to get from here to there. And so we're constantly just puzzled by this, even to build systems into the business. Well, systems is a wonderful magic word, but if you don't have a legitimate way to have the time to build systems, to have the ability to know what a system is and how to kind of implement it, then it's, it's a great thing to know. It's fantastic, but it, it's very hard to get from where you are to where you really want to be. Listen up. 
Now remember, being self-employed is not the same as being a business owner. And if you are looking for a way to automate your business and build yourself a clear path to the dream that keeps eluding you, then check out my online small business bootcamp. It's a go at your own pace, it's power packed, it's a mind bomb. It will help you understand exactly how to architecture out and systematize your small business right now so you can finally be back in control. Go to windowwealth.com right now and check it out. Use the code MINDBOMB to save 30%. It's time to invest in yourself. And that's kind of where Tweet comes in because the concept is a lot of times we have really good things going on, but with just a few little tweaks here or there, whether it be in the marketing or whether it be in the structures and systems in the business, uh, just a little bit of tweaking helps things run smoother. Absolutely. And you're 100% right that people get overwhelmed by the idea of systems because it's a cold, corporate, horrible word, right? They don't know where to start. One of my concepts, you probably have something similar with your tweak consulting, but is, is to encourage people to start with an MVS, a minimum viable system. And all that means is you don't need some 13-page formatted beautiful pdf you know to deploy to your team through a six-hour meeting to do a system just just create something that enhances or improves a process inside your business it could be a half of a paragraph in a word doc that says when the office runs out of toilet paper this is how we order toilet paper you know and and as silly as that is that one thing enhances your company and the thing about systems is when you build these things they stay in place and they continue running which is so beautiful. So the time you spend working on them pays off for years and years many times, uh, which is just a, a great thing. Someone recently said, you want to know if you have a business or if you have a job, take a vacation during the, your busy season. If you can take a vacation during your busy season and not worry about checking in on your office and everything like that, then you've built a business. You've built something that's, that's viable. Wow, that is a really, really good perspective. I would love that. So this is something I'd like to add. Uh, Brian Tracy makes a comment about uh, racehorses and how that the winning racehorse might win 100 times more prize money than the horse that comes in second. Well, does that mean that he was 100 times faster than the horse that came in second? Well, no. A lot of times he only won by a quarter of an inch, by a nose, and he got a hundred times faster. And that's what tweak is about is the fact that a lot of times your business isn't necessarily broken, but with a small adjustment and a system uh, so that it's repeatable to the cup, you can then charge more. You can then make more. This is totally true. I hope the listener is getting the fact that you don't have to build some giant empire. You can take your small business that you have right now, enhance it. I call it iterating and optimizing it. And produce a, a multiplier of benefit inside your company. So what I mean is in a sea of five foot 10 people, you only need to be five foot 11 to stand out. You, you don't have to be, you know, Apple computer to win in life. And in your market, whatever business you have, you need to look at the little itty bitty things that no one pays attention to and be awesome at them and optimize them. And you will stand out like a sore thumb and that in turn will always lead to more profit. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, Josh, because I've been thinking within, we just got back from the huge convention a few weeks back, and the one thing that I picked up, and it wasn't from a class, it was just from a conversation it clicked, is that I need to figure out exactly what I'm absolutely best at and why my business and the things that are exactly like right in my wheelhouse and whatever doesn't fall into that, I'm going to find a way that somebody else can do it because they can do it just as well or better than me. Yeah, I've heard it said that the sweet spot for all of us, is where our passion intersects our knowledge. Where that intersects with what we're most passionate about, that is where you can really kill it. You know, And if you spend most of your day living in that zone, when you're passionate and you know what the heck you're doing, you need to live right there. Everything else you need to delegate out, right? It, lots of other people can clean a window, but not lots of other people can be passionate about your company and its vision and its future and where it's going. You need to be in that sweet spot working as many minutes as you possibly can. I am most passionate and have been through my entire life uh, on, on marketing and sales. I, I love with a passion marketing and sales. I kind of fall into the same place, Josh. I think the best thing I could would enjoy doing or the thing I would enjoy doing most would be a better way to say it would be consulting 
or working in advertising. Because it, things where you can brainstorm out a problem and come up with a solution or come up with a creative idea and uh, figure something out, especially if you get to work with a team. And I've just kind of now stumbled into a situation where it's uh, <laughs> I actually get to do those things. So I'm really kind of excited about that. Well, it is very exciting. And when you start a project that you're passionate about and you have you know in your back pocket the knowledge and life experience to go along with it, and you understand the importance of, you know, execution and all that. I mean, you guys are dangerous at this point, and I'm sure that this is going to really do very well for you because there is a huge need for this in the marketplace, and there's a huge itch that needs to be scratched. And, you know, in closing, guys, I want to ask you one more question. Why do you think so many small businesses fail? I think the number one reason is is cash flow because I, I talk to small business owners who start off without much cash, they get cash, they buy new equipment, and then they the next the slow season comes and the next busy season comes and the phone's not ringing and they have zero money to market, zero money to do anything. Absolutely. That's a huge one. And it's not just business owners, it's people in general. A lack of vision, a lack of focusing on the end game makes it really tough to make certain choices today. And what I mean is, is for example, with people, <laughs> it cracks me up. Every every fall going into the Christmas season, people absolutely lose their minds, open up 10 credit cards, spend way too much money on stuff they don't need. Um, and it's like they forgot that they were going to need money for Christmas, right? Like, oh, since when was Christmas on December 25th? What am I going to do? I think a lot of guys, they'll start a company. They don't have a, a very specific vision, but they'll get going with it. They'll experience some success. The business checking account has 10, 20 grand in it all of a sudden. And they say, man, I deserve a bass boat, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and they have the money. They're balling. They're balling. They're killing it. And so it's in their mind, it's totally justifiable. You know, I worked hard. This is time for me to go bass fishing. But it's a lot easier to make financial decisions later when you build a plan and think of the end right now today. Yeah, and sometimes it's not even the bass boat. It's bigger and better equipment. A lot of guys that are really good at their at their craft, they're, they're master technicians at something, whether it's a carpet cleaner or somebody who just really understands the pH of the chemicals and the thing and how to, you know, they're so obsessed with the trade itself that they really miss the picture on the business itself. And my company, my cleaning company, would, would outbid Lots of companies that were way better on a technical level than we were. But why was it that customers paid almost double to have us, who probably were technically a worse product in a lot of ways? It's because of that perceived value, the customer life cycle, us having a business model and not being obsessed with only one thing, which is having the perfect equipment and doing a perfect job. Couldn't agree with you more, Josh. How can the listeners get a hold of you guys if they want to connect with uh, Tweet Consulting or just ask you a question? There's a column that's coming out in eClean Magazine called Get Tweet. You can check that out, a free magazine from Allison Hester, as well as uh, they can email us at gettweet at tweetconsulting.com uh, with any questions that they might want to show up in that column, as well as uh, they can go to our website at www.tweet.com and be able to uh, ask questions there. And we, we do a lot of uh, free answering and blogging about those questions. But also, uh, if, if you need help uh, and we can be of help, uh, we, we'd be happy to, happy to help. Well, Absolutely. listen, guys, I appreciate you taking the time. I know both of you are very busy. You have a lot on your plate. And I, I carving out an hour isn't an easy thing to do. And I, you did it last minute. You really helped me out. And I think we provided some incredible value to the listeners. I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Josh. Watch out for the monkeys. Hey, thanks for hanging out, friends. And from all of us here at the Quick Talk Podcast team, we hope you love today's show. We hope that you were inspired to become a doer and not just a listener. Apply what you've heard today in your own business and watch things change for the better. Lastly, remember that all the money in the world can't save your soul. Seek first the kingdom of God, my friends. We'll see you next time. For more information about the Quick Talk Podcast or Joshua's other businesses, visit our website, quicktalkpodcast.com. Have a blessed day.